Hello, I'm Mark Tucker, and this is Two Voice Dabs. Hey there, I'm Alan Furstenberg. Ah, so how was your week, Mark? How's it been going? It's been going good. Um, just uh, digging in a lot more. I just recently have some uh, posts on Twitter talking about uh, this whole language model intent stuff, but th you know that's that's a topic for an, uh, probably another show. I'm still you know digging into that some. But uh, how was your week this last week? My week was interesting to say the least. We had a um, so so we had what turned out to be an outage as part of dialogue flow. Oh no! Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a whole bunch of actions which use dialogue flow appeared to work, but didn't, and were giving some strange error messages. So I started seeing, you know, requests on Stack Overflow saying, uh, you know, I'm trying to do this, but it keeps telling, it keeps going back to the fallback intent, which is just basically saying the, the shorthand way of saying it didn't understand what I was doing, mm -hmm. what the user said. But previously it worked fine. And you know, that was odd to me. And when I started digging in, into it, I started discovering some of my actions, which still use dialogue flow, were doing the exact same thing. Interesting. So when was when was when did you start noticing this? I started noticing this, I I, I think it was like Thursday morning was when I started seeing the posts on okay. Stack Overflow. And um, so I I I did a little research and I kind of immediately sent out a message to the some of the, the DevRel team that I know saying, here's what's going on. I don't know what's happening, but people are beginning to report this sort of stuff. So um, I don't know, did you hear about any of this? What were you well, seeing this is at the interesting. time? So, so this is Thursday. So Wednesday, um, coincidentally enough, so uh, my co coworker is Octavio uh, Menocal, um, great voice dev. And he had just added a feature to one of our released uh, Alexa skills to do the, the equivalent Google action for it. So um, he had done some final work on that. And like we do, we pass it back and forth. You know, he did the change, I did the code review, and we were working it through our different environments. And it got up to a point where it was in, a, in an alpha release stage so that we could test it internally. And so then when that happened, he let me know, and this is, this is Wednesday. Um, so, Earlier in the day, it was working for him on Wednesday, and then on uh, Wednesday later in the day, when I started testing it, I immediately hit this prompt at the beginning uh, of our um, action that was like a yes-no prompt, and it wasn't working. I'm like, hey, Octavio, what's this? Because this, it's not like him at all. He definitely tests this stuff, and I'm like, he just barely looked at this, so what's going on with that? And so he started looking into it, couldn't figure you know, it was driving him crazy as a developer. It's like, okay, what's the problem? It was working, it's not working. Mm -hmm. what, what changed is an environment thing. You know, going through all these different things. He finally posted it on uh, Slack and uh, and found out that Alarna from Matchbox.io also was having a similar issue. So, so then we actually thought to uh, test some existing actions out there and, and discovered it was a bigger problem than... Yeah. Than, uh, what, just one our one problem that we were trying to find and it was it was one of the more bizarre issues because you normally expect things to either fail completely or yeah. work correctly and this was in this this weird middle zone where some things were working fine you know some in some of the intent handling was working completely correctly and others right. weren't and one of the things that i think we started seeing as a pattern was um intents that were that were using a context so uh, a couple of weeks back, we talked about how it was great to have intents that could be narrowed to a particular context. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a end up being a pitfall in this case. So if you narrowed a, an intent to a context, for some reason, contexts were being thrown out completely. So if you registered an intent for a context, right. it would never get hit because the context didn't exist. Yeah, and so that so there was a bug reported, right? On, on Dialogflow, it turns out that uh, I think it uh, was uh, Diego Mesquita um, reported the bug to the dialogue flow team um, on Wednesday. And this was, uh, he's, in, he's in Brazil, and that would be like 8.33 p.m. Um, and they respond back in the middle of the night, like at 3.30 a.m. by, you know, by opening this, uh, I guess, responding to this ticket. And then Google, I guess, starts working on it throughout the day. Um, and, and, and so that's, this is unfolding Wednesday night through, um, through Thursday, and uh, 
you know, like you say, this, this idea of context was being reported and then and more people were looking at it and, and, and understanding, you know, from their perspective, how it was working. And, you know, in the end, you know, to Google's credit, um, they did get it fixed uh, right about, you know, just after 4 p.m. on that Thursday. So the outage wasn't, wasn't a huge outage. Um, but, but before we, because I, I do want to dive in definitely and talk about the, the tech behind it. But did you receive any notification uh, for any of your existing actions that there was a problem or an no. outage? No. So Th This is one of the, the odd problems of dialogue flow right now is dialogue flow kind of falls in a um, in an odd development environment area. So it's it's technically part of cloud platform. Mm -hmm. So it's run by the cloud platform team, not by the the assist interactions team. Oh, well, that's interesting. So well, part of it is the dialogue flow itself is marketed as a general purpose NLP. So it's not specifically for actions, but actions can use it, and there's some special casing for actions but it's meant as a broader tool for, for everyone. So like chatbots and other things that were built on top of Dialogflow would be broken as well. We just... Well, that's the thing is I didn't actually hear any reports about chatbots being broken. Hmm. All I heard about were that actions were broken. So it might have had something to do with the actions integration. It might have oh, had something to okay. do, it might have had something to do that most chatbots aren't complicated enough to use. Um, uh, contacts in the same way. So very few people reported the problem. Yeah, so so this functionality is something that's been working for years and it's a, like a, it's a, one of the core you know foundations that Dialogflow is built on it, top of. It, it's actually one of Dialogflow's best features is this notion yeah. of context. And so it was something that was working, had been working for years, yep. and all of a sudden stopped working sometime on Wednesday and started working again on Thursday. Any insights into what the problem was? Or unfortunately, how unfortunately, I don't. So, um, so no, none of my, all of my contacts, all they were able to say were things like, um, the dialogue flow team is treating this as a high priority item. So, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, there were some reports, for example, for a while that uh, the bug was flagged priority two, which means, you know, we'll get to it someday. Yeah. Um, and, I, I have a feeling that's just because there are actual, for every bug that we see externally, there's an internal bug that is separate. So the internal bug probably had the correct priority and the external one, they just didn't bother to update the priority on. Well, and that's interesting too. The, I, I was kind of surprised that there, we could see the bug report for it. <laughs> Well, and, so this and trace it through on that. That's something that's kind of visibility you don't get on Alexa, that's for sure. Google, well, you don't always get it in Google either. Some yeah, teams, okay. at, some teams at Google have a uh, high profile bug report, uh, um, high profile uh, issue tracking, mm -hmm. and others don't have high, you know, high visibility issue tracking. Uh, the actions team, for example, does not have uh, anything that tracks issues specifically related to actions, but the smart home team does, for example. The dialogue flow team does. And the dialogue flow team does mostly because of their affiliation with the cloud team. And cloud is really, really, tries to be really, really visible about okay. problems and issues and reporting it. But that leads to the other interesting aspect is cloud has a status dashboard where they list all of their, the, the usual cloud operations. Oh, and, and what the status are up or down, right? right. Or you know, and and give you regular updates about the status of things when things are down and when they expect to return and where they've seen you know. So you know, if if for whatever reason the you know, uh, U.S. West two zone is experiencing functional issues on DNS, that gets reported and you see that. Dialogflow okay. doesn't have an entry there. Oh, okay. So you know, you there are reports of Dialogflow not working in its cloud, but it's not showing up on the status dashboard because there isn't any entry for the status dashboard and. There, there was a lot of confusion about communication. That is interesting. Um, it's like Dialogflow was in, in invited to the party, but they won't quite let them in or something. <laughs> well, Dialogflow has been, I mean, it started out external to cloud and it's been slowly bit by bit integrating over the years. So now it's very clearly a cloud product. Yeah. Whereas even six months ago, it was still a little bit fuzzy whether it was a cloud product or not. No, no was Dialogflow something that this is, you know, I think it was something that Google bought. Is that yeah. true? So, okay. 
Dialogflow started as a company called API.ai. Oh, that's right. It's, and it's been a long time since I thought about this. Yeah, and, and shortly before um, Actions on Google launched, Google bought it to make sure that there was a very clear uh, NLP, NLU system available for Actions on Google. But they assigned it to cloud because it had all of these other abilities. Right. And those abilities have been growing and changing over the years, very much more in an enterprise cloud type focus. So they've got a slightly different focus than, than the assistant team does. It makes sense to split it like this. Yeah. But it does seem weird on the surface. Yeah, it does seem that it doesn't quite fit in any one specific yeah. slot. I, you know, I think one of the things to remember a lot of times, and this is true for Amazon as well, is, oh, sure is these, yeah. are, these are big companies. You know, so we as outsiders would say, you know, well, you know, it's, it's Google, it's Amazon. They should all do it exactly this way. And when you look, you know, behind the curtain, you see there's a lot of little groups, most of whom communicate okay with each other, some of whom don't some of whom aren't aware that the each other exists. Um, you know, so, so people like to treat Google and Amazon as monoliths, and they're not. They're, <laughs> they're, they're really not. Yeah, it's got a big facade pattern on the front of it. And it's, uh... <laughs> Getting so, back to development. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's see. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so give a summary again of what, uh, what the problem was on the intent context um, side of things. Um, from, you know, using the, the Google vernacular. And, um. So, so uh, one of the things that Dialogflow uh, does is it provides a kind of uh, session environment. And part of that environment is reflected through what it refers to as a context. Uh, sorry, yeah, context. So you can create a context and require that an intent only be triggered if that context is valid. That context can then also store things like what parameters were set during an intent, or you can set parameters manually. Um, but this acts as a, um, a context-specific storage media. So as long as that context is active, and you can set timeouts for a context right. as part of a conversation, you know, uh, three rounds of a conversation, for example, and the context expires. Um, as long as the context is active, the values in it, the parameters in it are stored. So this main, is a good way to maintain information in between rounds of a conversation. Okay. And do you know how that's implemented as far as where that data resides? Because in the end, a Google action um, and an Alexa skill is a webhook. It's an HTTP post. You get a JSON request and you get a JSON response, right? In the end, that's, that's you know, that's the bare bones of how it works. Um, so where, I guess, does that intent context information live uh, as it's going, doing these multiple turns, uh, request, response, request, response? It lives, there, there are one of two possible layers that it can live. So you can establish a session as part of dialogue flow. And sometimes that context is managed as part of that session by dialogue flow. Okay. And Actions on Google version two also had the notion of a session storage. And some of, so some of it could have gotten stored as part of the session storage. Um, and then there's a, a translation layer basically in between the two when we're talking actions to, to dialogue flow. So one now possibility is- is, 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 it, is it server only? I'm not sure what you mean by that question. So this is does something- the, does, does the data always just stay on the server or does it, go back to the client and then go back to the server. In the context of, uh, so client in the sense being the, the assistant, the assistant yeah. on the device. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not reflected on the client at all. Okay. These aren't reflected in the, these aren't reflected in the client. So it's stored in a data store somewhere at Google. Okay. One way or the other, it's stored in a data store somewhere at Google. Um, okay. And this will probably be relevant as we discuss the newer ways of doing storage. So, uh, and in addition to that storage, there's also what Google refers to as user storage. And that's something that is maintained on the actions on Google level, again, in a Google server. Cancel. Um, <laughs> the mic's off. The mic's off now. Um, <laughs> So, and that is something that is maintained in Google in their servers um, and is maintained for, for a user 
Um, the interesting bit about that is that is visible to users if they want to see it. Okay. So that's interesting because um, in the end, the, the webhook that we're, the code that we're running is stateless. So there's got to be some level, some, some piece or pieces of information that are passed along with the request that goes to the response that goes back to the request so that, that you can access that, that uh, context data, right? Um, so let me explain a little bit of how the equivalent would work on, on Alexa side of things. So right. now, now, as I understand it, Alexa itself doesn't store any session or user data for you at all. That, that, is, that is true. Um, so there is this concept of um, like session storage, you know, information for a specific user during a specific session. So when I start up or, you know, launch my, my skill, then a session is created and with every re response request then that session id is is passed so, so there is a way to know what that session is um, so there's the ability to store something at the session level but there you can also persist data and so that's where you would get something like dynamo db or some other you know persistent store involved um, where you can store information that would persist across sessions. So like when I end my um, skill and then if I were to immediately start it back up again, that would be a completely new session. But if I had stored my, you know, persisted my data in the database, um, then I would, you know, have it back and it would be all good to go. Now, what, yeah, now, go ahead. Now, now, so you say, so storing data in between sessions, you're keying that off of something like a, a user ID. Well, so for, for, user for user storage, I use the user ID and I store that as the key and then this blob of data, whatever I want to persist across sessions in, in that. Interestingly enough, there is the ability to set things on session for Alexa. And what that actually does is part of that response that comes back to the client are these session variables. It's it's like a really, really old style cookie, I guess, where then the, the, you know, whatever, if I set, you know, five different values, those five different variables and their values are, you know, enclosed in the JSON and returned back to the client. And then on my next request as part of that same session, the client passes those same things back to the server. And so I can round trip um, and, you know, and pass information on now, you know, well, that's interesting, and that and that yeah. is sent back to the device itself. Yeah, exactly. Oh, huh. So, so yeah, so so it round trips, um, and uh, that's so that's one way of keeping it. So that, you know, from the context, from I, what I was seeing or how I interpreted that, because um, you know, when I use Jovo and on top of Jovo, you can store things for the session and you can store things for the user, and so I know that. When I store it for the user, it's in the database, and when I store it for the session, it's being round tripped. And so that's, from my perspective, I was thinking, oh, there's something going wrong with the information that's going back to, you know, in this case, Google Assistant, and it's not getting passed back. But behind the scenes, Google, I mean, behind the scenes, Jovo is doing something completely different with that session state, and it's using these contexts. Um, so that's that's what they've done is behind this this. Uh, this layer where now as a developer, all I have to worry about is, uh, is am I storing this at the session level or the, the user level? Um, behind the scenes, it uses whatever technology is available in Dialogflow 2 in this case to persist those contexts. Um, is, you know, it must be what, what's happening because during this whole process of where you know, Google was trying to figure out what was wrong and how to fix things, um, Alex um, from, from Jovo team, uh, went ahead and created this ability, um, released a, an update to Jovo, which is just awesome. You think about it, this is open source. You've got you know thousands of developers using this, and you have a bug that comes out on a platform that's nothing that, to do with you know directly with the you know what what oh, you're exactly, doing. Yeah. That they're able to come up with a fix, which is now and it's just a little flag that says I want to go ahead and persist the session stuff in my database too. So if I already have, uh, I'm using a database, which most people are, um, you know, to get any type of 
information across sessions. Like even to say, you know, welcome versus welcome back, right. you need to know yeah. if the person was there before. And so one of the first things I always do is, is add a database to my uh, project so that it can persist those. So they just change that. So what happens is that now behind the scenes, it's storing it in the database. It's not using the Google intent context problem that, you know, the area that was having the problem. Mm -hmm. And you, you could have, you know, pushed out. And because this would be a code only change, it wouldn't have to go through search. Mm -hmm. Right. You could have conceptually, you know, hours earlier before um, Google had it fixed, you could have implemented this up and gone of, live again. Yeah. Of Jovo framework and pushed out those changes live and been fixed. So, so if you were only relying on uh, context to store data and not to manage your, your state. Because if you're managing state, though you're still running into the problem. Oh, but that's, no. yeah. But, but it's, a fa it's a fascinating solution. And I, it relies on the fact that a, a session ID is still sent along with every request. Yeah. So they were able to key off of the session ID. But right. th that actually leads me back to a, an interesting question that I had um, related to user storage. Mm -hmm. So user storage has to be maintained. You have to maintain it. Yes. And that's keyed off of a user ID that is provided from Alexa? Yeah. That's interesting. So, yeah. So um, when you enable a skill, so for, for my, my um, Amazon account that's linked to Alexa, when I say I want to enable a skill, I get assigned a unique user ID. So it's it's not related to anything else. So if I enable another skill, even by the same, you know, um, I guess company that created the first skill, right? Each there each, is no visibility. I am I am two separate user right. IDs. Each, each skill gets its own pool of user IDs, and there's no so, right. Yeah, and so if I disable that skill and then relabel it again, I'll get a different get, user ID. Yep. No, the part of the reason I find it interesting is that Google used to give a user ID and they deprecated and removed it about a year ago. And the reason- I, why, I never understood quite why that was. You know, once again, I use Jovo and behind the scenes, Jovo creates one for right. you. Govo, Jovo goes and creates a user one and stores it in Google's user storage because that every, you need that. Um, yeah. The only reason I could figure out why they might have done so is because they were concerned about GDPR compliance, and one of and, and one of the restrictions around GDPR and GDPR is so far from my specialty. I really shouldn't even be talking about it this much. <laughs> but people whose specialty it is said, "Yeah, user IDs are a GDPR item," and I'm like, "Huh? How how is that a GDP?" They're like, "Well, you know, it 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 can be traced to an individual over time. It it becomes a personally identifiable item." I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me, but if you say so, okay. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if at some point, you know, Google's lawyers said, you know, we don't like the looks of this ID here. Uh, either, yeah. you, either you need to make, make sure you specifically request people use it or, you know, get, get people's permission to use it or we take it out. And, and even now on the, the pages about storing user information, there's this big, bold warning in red that says, make sure you have gotten user permission to store any information. That's right. So they've, uh, yeah, they pass it on to the developer of course, company yeah. okay. so to make sure that's, that that's the case. So that, that's interesting. You know, um, while we're talking about storage though, I want to point out something that, uh, that Google just introduced with Actions Builder is they introduced a new form of storage, okay. which, which is interesting. It's what they call home storage. So this is data that you can, uh, similar to user storage and session storage, it's you know a set of parameters that you can store. And this will be available on any device in the same home graph as the device you just saved it to. So if okay. you've got multiple devices around the house, you can save it, you know, you can save this information and somebody else in the same household can get it on any of the devices. So it's not attached to a person, it's attached to a collection of devices. That's interesting. Um, 
So is it is it uh, something that if I was disconnected from the cloud, I would still be able to access, meaning that it's actually stored down locally? I, or is uh, it? Once again, I doubt that it is actually stored locally, uh, especially, okay. although maybe it is. Um, I, I mostly doubt that because it means pushing data to a bunch of different devices, some of which may be offline at, at any given time. So, okay, so I, this is... <laughs> so I, I think it's more a yeah. conceptual because storage. When, when we're talking about a user ID on the Alexa side of things, it's actually linked to the Alexa, to the Amazon account that's linked to Alexa which would be for all the devices that are in your home would use that same right. account. You don't so have the that user, That doesn't happen in Google? Not necessarily. So like, if I have multiple devices in my house, they could come be two different uh, accounts? They could be on two different accounts and even more so that when using one, if somebody else who was not a verified user tried to use one of my devices, it would still work, but it wouldn't register as me because it knows it's not me. Oh. It, it reports as an unverified user. That's interesting because there is a personalization feature that's part of uh, Alexa where you can train and say, you know, this is Mark and here's, I answered some questions and now it kind of knows right. my voice footprint, yeah. right? Um, though it does confuse my son sometimes with me because you can you can ask you know Alexa who am I and like oh this is yeah when the voices are or, close enough yeah yeah so so the, and, and nothing that I've seen so far has been you know integrated I, this would be an, an, an interesting feature added to Jova would be the ability to flip a switch and have it be personalized something to the effect of if you're if you have one of those personalization things then you could enable it so you would have your own storage but maybe that you also get to have values that are stored per account. That would be interesting where you that can would kind be of interesting, yeah. Of, um, features, but yeah, that, that hasn't been built yet, but that's definitely interesting in, in how to store information. Home storage is an interesting concept. I haven't seen it used a great deal yet. Yeah. Um, mostly because it's, it's in some ways hard to picture. I mean, you can sort of picture places where it might be used. You know, anybody in the household wants to know what the household to-do list is or add an item to the household shopping list or something. Yeah. So from that sense, it's kind of clever. Yeah, I was, but there, I, I was there, thinking, there are odd restrictions to it still. So you know, Google doesn't have an Echo Auto device, you know, specifically, but um, I was thinking of, you know, like yeah, we'll talk about that another have, time. Yeah. Sorry. Um, you, so uh, let's say that you have, you know, devices in your car and you have three different cars and it's shared across family members. You know, there's usually, you know, dad's car and you know, mom's car and then kid's car, but sometimes kids use your car. There could be with this voice personalization, uh, like maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a, uh, a voice app that's remembering where you are in a you know, particular place. Like you can say, you get there and say, hey, I'm in you know, space C24, you know, one, two, three, or something like that. But maybe with the, the, the context, then you could, uh, then somebody else could ask like, where is the, you know, where's the beast? You know, maybe you name your cars, right? right? Like, where's the beast? And like, the beast is at blah, 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 blah. You know, so-and-so has the beast and it's at such and such because they know who you were but I don't know. But no, it's a good question. It's, it's, a, it's a challenging one because one of the issues with home storage is that, well, there, there are two issues of it in my mind. The first is that mobile devices aren't included because mobile devices aren't part of the home graph. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the second is that you don't get access to device information itself. So I can't, for example, add something on the kitchen device and say, where was I when I added, when somebody added this? Because it doesn't have that level of context exposed to developers. Okay. So. Um, is, is there this concept, do, do you get device IDs? Like on the Alexa side, no. every device has a unique, some, and right now it's just some ID saying that this is the device that it happened on. 
So you could be clever and create a skill that you could go from house to house and say, you know, tell XYZ skill that I'm in the kitchen or something like that. And then you go through and you could put names associated to those. Yep. And yeah, you could do something. Nope. We have, like you, it, it, there is no device ID and no access to the, there is no access to the home graph information that Google does maintain. Okay. So we, and we know, Google, well, let me rephrase it. There is no device ID or access to that home graph information for conversational actions. Smart home actions do get access to that, obviously, but it's different. They, they have different access in general. Yeah, just um, Amazon just recently um, started to merge these where you can, because before, if you had a, um, a skill that was a smart home skill, it would be separate than a custom skill. Um, but they've just merged them recently that you could have both satisfied in the same skill. Um, so that's, that's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know if we'll start seeing something like that. If this home storage and, you know, if this home storage capability, now that it's there, if that's the wedge in the door to getting us other home graph related features in conversational actions, that would be interesting. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know where that's going. But I think right now, uh, they're, you know, the same reason why we don't get device IDs is they're just concerned about privacy exposure. They don't want to leak yeah. too much information out to, to every developer. Oh, but information is helpful as a developer to make the experience better. Well, I think, you know, this is going to be something you and I will return to many times, I am sure. But yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's the problem is, you know, the more context that we get, the better. But the more context that we get, the bigger a privacy uh, exposure could could cost. Well, that's interesting because on the flip side, on Google, you have access to the complete sentence that the user has said. Yes. <laughs> and, and on Amazon, you don't. Yeah, you have to. You know, you get uh, you can create slots, and then you get to know what the slot value was. Now, the slot value could fall in bounds or out of bounds of the samples that you gave, but you get access to the value that was in the slot, but you don't get access to the whole. So that, so that is interesting that in that one case, it's right. all. Yep, no, that is it. I mean, that's, that's an odd, exception. and I, I get the same thing when people say, well, can I get, you know, the, the voice recording of the person who said it? And I'm like, no, yeah, nice. yeah. for good reason, but you can get the whole sentence. Uh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's, it's interesting figuring out you know, almost, almost all of these decisions we know boil down to security, but it's interesting trying to understand why. Yeah, no, that's true. Well, I'm glad that Google fixed the bug. Yeah, uh, me too. And they did it so in a timely fashion. It does bring up some questions on um, being more transparent or notifying, you know, there were a whole bunch of, I, I felt like I had to go out on social media and say, hey, everybody, if you have um, you know, a Google action, just check it out to see if it works or not, because nothing official was coming out of uh, on Google on that. Yeah, no, it's really tough to, you know, the, it's, it's always an odd line to see how companies respond to outages and make sure their, their, you know, their customers, their clients, their partners are aware of it. Right. And, and you know, it's a tough call. Yeah, it is a, definitely a tough but, call. But I agree with you. I, I lean towards the more transparency uh, is, is always better. Yeah, because you know, lots of lots of in, people individually are like, I don't know why this isn't working, or you know, what did I do wrong? And it, you know, you know lots of uh, you know, developer hours were spent tracking down something that wasn't a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ellen, it's been an exciting week with uh, you know the Google outage and trying to figure out uh, what happened with it and uh, you know you know what to do to to mediate um, so that it doesn't happen. Again, Again, yeah, but yeah. but that's the fun part of being a developer in a in a you know leading edge industry. Yeah, yeah, it's maybe not so fun when it's happening, and you know, oh, that's definitely to, true. It's yeah. a problem or somebody else's, but but the, I don't know. I I still think it's fun. I'm still I'm still glad to be part of the industry. That's for sure. You know. Oh for, yeah, definitely. For all the for all the bumps and rough spots that we we hit and are going to hit going forward. I'm still glad to, to be working on this stuff. Yeah, I, I definitely am too. And you know, there's 
there's a lot of pushing that I do to say, oh, I wish this feature or, you know, you should do something different. And that's, it's not a knock at all on, you know, no, I, companies. It's, it's because I care so much about it. I really want this to succeed and I, I want it to make sense and, and be the best that it can be. No, you know, the, I think the reason why both of us push the, the companies we work closest with is because, you know, we want to see great things out there. We see, you know, we have this, yeah. this big vision and we need to help them take those little steps to get to that big vision. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So um, I agree with you completely. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't want anybody to, to construe this as, you know, negative or bashing because, you know, lots of respect to everybody that's doing things behind the scenes and for getting the technology to where it's at. Right. And, you know, um, certainly the people who had to deal with the problem, I have the yeah. utmost respect for, you know, I've, I've been on that end myself, troubleshooting problems mm -hmm. that, you know, a system that worked 24 hours earlier and you didn't change anything. Everyone from, from Google's developers all the way down to the people whose code were impacted. I really, you know, I feel for all of us because that's, that's a yeah. tough situation to be in. Dialog flow team. We appreciate um, behind the scenes, uh, down little pieces of it that finally got this reported. That's it for us this week. So that's, uh, I'm Mark from Two Voice Devs. Two Voice Devs. Have a great week, everyone. Yeah, take care.